anybody doesn't want to be if anyone doesn't want to be on the on camera please feel free to turn your cameras off and we will let you know when we stop the recording for the Q&A at the end and so now I'll hand over to Lisa and we'll get the session started. Thanks very much, Christine. And uh, my intro is really just a list of thanks. Uh, first, thank you very much all for coming along today. Uh, we're really excited by this research at AIM. Uh, we think it's a fascinating uh, topic that's uh, exploring the connections between museums and audiences uh, and the people who work in, in museums and volunteer in museums is something I think we think we all kind of know what we're doing and know what we think is happening but we haven't really had the research behind it before so uh, we were very excited to uh, partner with Art Fund on this research so thank you to Art Fund uh, and thank you to Elliot and Mariel who have done such a wonderful job of the research and we'll be coming back over to shortly to uh, to talk about it. Uh, really looking forward to hearing what you all make of it and hopefully it will be something that is of use to you all and to the wider sector for years to come uh, in understanding a bit more about what we've done. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, over to you, Sarah, from Art Fund as well, just to speak a little bit. Um, thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming today. Hello, I'm Sarah. I'm the Director of Programme and Policy at Art Fund. Um, I thought it might be very quickly just interesting to give you all a little bit of background about where Art Fund came from in terms of um, commissioning this research. And really, like many things, it started in the pandemic. And um, when we all noticed this sort of upsurge in support for kind of culture more generally. And um, we really wanted to understand how you might um, build and sustain that kind of support post pandemic. Um, and really the question that was kind of, kind of the inspiration for us was how might you win hearts as well as minds. And, um, it's a it's a fascinating question and I'm really grateful to AIM for um, being equally fascinated and wanting to explore it with us and to Elliot and to Mariel for um, for um, also um, taking it on as a challenge and producing such a really interesting, interesting um, report. So, yeah, uh, enough for me. You, you want you want to hear from them. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so we're going to hand over to Mariel for the presentation now. If anyone's got any questions, please feel free to pop those into the chat and we'll get um, answer those at the end. Also, if you want to ask any at the end, we'll get to those at the end as well. Great. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, everyone. Um, can you? Yes, you can see my screen. Great. Let's go into it. Um, so, hello, um, my name is Meriel. Um, I work at the BA and also as a freelance consultant. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I was brought onto this project, so I um, do freelancing as a consultant, but I was brought on by Elliot from MEL Research. And MEL were asked by AIM and Art Fund to investigate um, the emotional drivers behind um, the public's. Uh, motivation to support museums, not only in times of crisis, like during COVID, but long term, um, like Sarah said. Um, I'm going to be introducing you to the research today, um, adding some context and insight that isn't in the report itself, but hopefully you've had a chance to at least flick through it, if not read it cover to cover. Um, so a quick roadmap of what we're going to cover. Um, we're going to cover the challenge behind the research, um, how we approached it, what we discovered, and then finally suggestions on how you can apply um, these findings to your own museum. Um, so to kick off, um, I'm going to ask for your forgiveness because I'm going to talk about Christmas. Um, I know it was two months ago, um, but I'm specifically going to be talking about Christmas adverts. You can probably tell where this is going already. Um, if I asked you to picture a memorable Christmas advert, which one jumps to mind and why? So is it the cheeky humour and charm of Kevin the Carrot? Is it the excitement of seeing the Coca-Cola truck for the first time? or any one of these. This is the best one, I'm gonna die on that hill. <laughs> um, this is not a Christmas advert. This is a guy called Antonio Damasio. 
Um, and while he isn't from Ecclesiastes, I bet John Lewis and Audi and Coca-Cola all have a lot to thank him for. Um, he's a Portuguese American neuroscientist and author of a seminal study in the 1990s about how our brain's ability to make decisions is completely governed by our emotions. So the frontal lobe of the brain is where our emotions are processed. But this guy empirically proved the link between emotions and decision making. He discovered that when you damage the frontal lobe, whether that's the illness or injury or, or surgery, your ability to make decisions and have good judgment completely evaporates. So it's the same reason why toddlers will happily scale a bookshelf because they're always on top and they're completely oblivious of danger or why teenagers do really risky things and push boundaries because their frontal lobe hasn't developed yet and they're not able to join up that decision-making and their emotional brain because their emotional brain hasn't developed. So like the Christmas adverts, the frontal part of our brain is also why these advertising campaigns have been successful in making us feel happy, feel sad, feel ownership, feel anger. Interesting that uh, COVID was brought up in terms of emotional responses. Um, feel guilt or feel amused. So this is McDonald's We Speak Late Night campaign in New Zealand, which I think is brilliant. Um, so the advertising industry has used this technique, so playing on people's emotions to influence their decisions for decades and decades. You've probably all heard of advertising with the discussion around the John Lewis adverts and everyone getting maybe a little bit bored of the sub stories every Christmas. Um, but we were asked by both AIM and Art Fund to investigate the role that emotions played in the public's decision to support museums, both in terms of crisis and stability. But I know that you know that you're not Coca-Cola, you're not McDonald's, you don't have multi-million pound budgets to run huge advertising campaigns, and we as museums have visitors and audiences, not customers. But the premise is exactly the same. Visitors, like customers, make a choice to invest their attention and their time, and in some cases money, in our museums. And our sector is actually, I would argue, on the front foot when it comes to emo evoking emotions in our audience. You, you need only skim through some of the TripAdvisor reviews like these to see how visitors can connect really emotionally with the museum experiences. Coca-Cola and McDonald's might, might, uh, might make for a nice lunch, but they really can't make you feel amazed or help, help you feel really inspired and connected to history or move you to tears with the stories contained in their collections. So, this is especially true when museums are facing closure at risk of funding cuts, or when many museums suddenly find themselves standing upon a bedrock of public support that they didn't realise they had. The emotions that are invoked when a museum really suddenly has its funding cut, sadness and anger and disbelief and frustration, kick our frontal lobes into gear and prompt us to take action when previously we might have been indifferent. And that's why we don't really see that, that really strong emotional support during times of stability and not just in times of crisis. So our challenge from AIM and Art Fund was to uncover the emotional drivers behind the public support for the museum sector. So we were looking at which emotions played the strongest role in driving support, were some more effective than others, were some emotions better to invoke short-term support while others were better to say, sustain support over a lifetime. So our research questions were, what can we learn from successful and unsuccessful, unsuccessful campaigns to save museums and how did they work on an emotional level? Which emotions are at play in those campaigns and how are they leveraged to make a difference and to engage the wider public? What insights or lessons can be transferred or harnessed so that museums, funders and sector support organisations might encourage greater public engagement before that threat arises? And what arguments resonate on an emotional level in the public consciousness? And therefore, what are the implications for influencing policy? So our approach, um, we took a four pronged approach to this research. We conducted some qualitative interviews with museum leaders. So by that, I mean um, members of staff working in museums, qualitative in interviews with community leaders, an online research community with members of the public and also a sector survey, which you might have seen circulate last year after the AIM conference. So when we were researching museums to participate in this re research, we first had to define what a campaign for support was. So we drew up a really long list of museums from across the UK of loads of different sizes and um, with different funding arrangements and with different subject matters, but all who had had to engage with the public in some way to ask for their help, support or money and um, to either help them remain open or continue with their regular opening hours. Um, or who had mounted a really particular crowdfunding campaign from the public to fund a particular project or object conservation, things like that. So we sought to include museums who had been at risk of closure um, or budget cuts or reduced hours, had received opposition to proposed plans to change their scope or remit, 
hadn't opened after COVID-19, um, had not yet opened, so they were a completely new museum, um, had been the subject of petitions for support, whether that was initiated by the museum themselves or by third party, had crowdfunded for funds, um, to conserve something, for example, um, had crowdfunded for just essential funds to um, cover their running costs to remain open, um, or who had launched a campaign through Art Happens, which is Art Fund's free crowdfunding platform for museums and galleries. So after that long list, we settled on the short list of um, the Skylight Nine Recovery Trust in Dumbarton, um, St. Mungo Museum, St. Mungo's Museum of Religious Life and Art in Glasgow, the Williamson in Birkenhead, Creswell Crags in Worksop, Newtown Textile Museum in Wales, the Lowood Museum in Greater London, and also the Cinema Museum. Um, so we interviewed staff from across all of these museums, as well as these community leaders. So these are basically members of the museum's local community, or in the case of the Cinema Museum, it was a community of interest, so people who are interested in cinema, who had played a really pivotal role in helping the museum communicate their campaign to the public. So in some circumstances, these were volunteers or part of the Friends Association, some were trustees, or some were just members of the public who'd started a petition because they felt strongly about their museum. Um, so all of these museums we interviewed had really varying levels of public support. Some of them had had hugely successful crowdfunders that had, you know, raised thousands upon thousands of pounds, and some of them had campaigns for support which had really little public engagement. And then we added this afterwards with this online research community with 24 members of the public to ask them more generally about their emotional reasons for visiting museums, not necessarily supporting them. So the big question, what did we discover? Um, having spoke to dozens and dozens of people about the emotional reactions that, that museums instigate in them, we discovered that the real range of emotions that museums provoke is absolutely massive. So they evoke, museums evoke a really huge range of emotions and some were light and fleeting, such as feeling entertained or content, while others were much deeper and more impactful long-term emotions like feeling hopeful or empowered or feeling important. Um, we realised really quickly that it was going to prove quite a challenge to try and structure, you know, 200 odd emotions into a, um, a report that made sense and to group them in particular ways. But as we interviewed more people, we started to see these patterns emerging between different types of emotions and the types of reactions that those emotions generated in people. So we began to see that some of the emotions people spoke about really passionately were to do with a feeling of purpose. So they were emotions such as pride, which made people feel really fulfilled or empowered or significant. And if you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is the triangle of, of all the needs that humans need to exist. Um, these are all the emotions that are involved in the very top tier of the pyramid to do with sort of self-actualization and um, being the best sort of person you can be. Um, then there are emotions that all to do with connection. So these are really social emotions, which make people feel understood or appreciated or seen and connected not only with other people, but also with ourselves, with our communities, with our history or with their town or their sense of place. And these are all the emotions that are to do with love and belonging in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So friendship, family, intimacy, um, that sort of thing. And finally, by far the most prevalent emotions that we found were simple emotions that brought people pleasure. So more fleeting emotions that made us feel good about ourselves in the moment, um, such as joy, happiness, feeling welcomed and feeling confident. Um, we discovered that these emotions varied in prevalence um, in intensity and most importantly, played a really different role in shaping people's decision-making. Um, so we created a pyramid of our own, a model for mapping the emotional drivers for people to engage with campaigns, uh, with museums, sorry. So at the bottom of the pyramid in the blue is our feelings of pleasure. So museums can create pleasurable emotions in people because they're places to have fun, they're somewhere to go to feel really relaxed or amused or amazed or entertained. And these were emotions that came up again and again in our interviews and, and especially with pe um, members of the general public who maybe didn't have that close connection and, and relationship with the museum. Um, they were by far the most prevalent. They require little to no effort to foster because they just sort of um, come out naturally from our work um, and most visitors would be really hard pressed not to feel at least one pleasurable emotion um, as you walk through a museum. Um, however, while they are really commonplace, they're quite fleeting emotions. So they might, people might feel in the moment as they walked around the museum, um, but these emotions didn't necessarily follow them home and can easily be sustained in the long term. And they were also spoken about with much less emotional intensity. So people might describe, describe themselves as feeling happy when they visit a museum but when you dig deeper it's the sort of happiness that people associate with a nice day out with their family as opposed to the sort of happiness that they'd associate with their wedding day or the birth of their child. 
Next up, we have emotions that make us feel connected. So crucially, we found loads of different ways in which museums can make us feel emotionally connected. Um, they can make us feel connected to ourselves and, uh, and our, our identities, why is that so difficult to say? Um, our friends and our family, our neighbours, our communities, but also our heritage, whether that's personal or our local heritage, our history and our sense of place. Um, these emotions were felt much more strongly than pleasurable emotions. So people enjoy, enjoy feeling connected and understood and relevant for the people. But these emotions were less commonly cited, but when they were cited, they were so cited by existing museum supporters. So these were the emotions that people who had more of a relationship and a close bond with museums tended to feel. So members of the public who felt really valued and supported, who really valued and supported their local museums did so because they felt a sense of ownership over them, um, sometimes nostalgia, so their memories of, them, of this museum were really strong and of belonging and acceptance too. Um, they really valued museums because they could bind together their local com community and act as a unifier for safe spaces or safe spaces for everyone and anyone to participate in. Um, these were less easy but not impossible to foster, but they did rely on museums having some really close links to other people, organize, organizations and communities, which was happening in some of the museums we interviewed, but not necessarily in others. Um, and while they're more difficult to foster, when they are fostered successfully, museums started to build a really solid base of public support to back their petitions and crowdfunding campaigns, um, as well as to encourage people to become members or volunteers or trustees. And finally, we have feelings of purpose. So we use this category to group together um, really probably quite intangible emotions. So things like feeling empowered or dutiful or grateful or knowledgeable that are all, like I said earlier, to do with sort of self-actualization and, and self-improvement. Um, we found that museums evoke emotions in people that make that grant people a sort of sense of agency over their lives really and allow them to feel like they're doing doing something really beneficial and meaningful by participating and engaging with the museum. So that might be beneficial for them. Um, so for instance, feeling knowledgeable or um, building their self-confidence but it might also be beneficial for other people. So lots of community leaders we spoke to had worked really tirelessly and given so much time in, to support their favorite museum. Um, I've just got a notice saying your internet connection is unstable. This is not ideal. <laughs> um, uh, loads of community leaders had worked tirelessly um, and dedicated their time and energy and money because they felt like it was the right thing to do. So it, was, it made, made them feel good by helping other people. Um, they felt really compelled to preserve their knowledge and the history and the heritage of an at-risk museum in order to benefit other members of their community as well as future generations. And the emotional reward that they felt by supporting the museum made them feel really proud, really fulfilled and really hopeful for the future. Um, and in more than one interview, actually, you could really see how emotional staff were in, in, in sort of describing um, the impact that they had on their visitors and their community. Um, one of the best examples of this was probably the Skylight Nine Recovery Trust in Dumbarton. Um, so I'm going to give you a really quick background to Skylight Nine because it's an amazing story. Um, so Skylight Nine was originally a, a pleasure boat who in 1940 um, was one of the fleet of uh, little ships who rescued Allied soldiers from Dunkirk. Um, and she was used for decades more as a pleasure boat and she was then used by uh, veterans for remembrance ceremonies for over 30 years, but unfortunately sank in 2010. Um, and a crowdfunding campaign um, in partnership with the Scottish Maritime Museum helped raise funds to conserve Skylark. Um, but the Skylark Recovery Trust also works in partnership with a community organisation called Alternatives Community Drug Recovery Project, um, working with people who had overcome addiction. Um, and they have a boat building project which is um, designed to, to mimic the, the recovery of their clients, but also recovery of the boat itself. Um, and it's designed for alternatives um, service users to gain boat, boat building and joinery skills and confidence um, and purpose really as part of their journey um, to recovery um, alongside other volunteers in the community. Um, and we interviewed uh, the community engagement lead at the Recovery Trust who spoke so eloquently about why the public support for, for this project is so strong. Um, and there's a quote on the screen that says, I do actually believe that what we're doing in the community now is so meaningful to people that it'll be a really emotional time when she returns, when Skylark returns to Dumbarton. It'll be something that people go, yes, she's back. It's that sense of ownership that is vital to keeping that going. And for our boat builders, it means having their place in the world. They've come through their recovery and they're working on their recovery every day. Just having that sense of purpose and to get up for that makes them feel a sense of belonging. They feel pride in being part of the crew. 
So speaking of pride, um, this leads me on to our next key discovery, um, which was our nine key emotions that we highlighted in the report as the most commonly cited emotions to do with museums, um, and which were the most successful in motivating people to, to support museums, whether that's financially or with their time. Um, so the first, like scar, like the first, like Skylark, um, epitomizes is pride. So museums make people feel proud of their identity, of their heritage, of their community, and it should also say themselves. Um, fulfillment. Museums provide emotionally rewarding learning experiences, which make people feel fulfilled. Hope. So museums inspire optimism and make people feel hopeful for the future. And um, moving on to connection, museums. And make people feel belonging. So um, they provide welcoming spaces which make us feel like we belong. They provide opportunities for nostalgia. So people's memories of museums are really loaded with emotion. And nostalgia was a really key motivator for, motivator for people to support museums. And finally, ownership. So people are really highly invested in museums when they feel a sense of ownership um, in them and like they have a say in what is reflected in their collections. Um, and on to pleasure, um, the three key emotions here were curiosity, so feeling curious about the world, um, this, this drives our motivation to engage with museums, or people feel awe in, in, uh, in awe of the scale of museums yeah. collections and often the physical spaces or the objects themselves, and excitement, so the promise of seeing amazing one of a kind things sparks excitement in people. Um, so the big question is where do you even start? with this whole report. There's a lot in the report. Um, we worked hard to try and condense it down, but we, the, the insights were so rich. Um, but to, to actually pinpoint where to start in terms of um, identifying the emotions that you currently evoke in your audience is actually quite difficult. Obviously, we're all human. We have emotions as individuals. But trying to pinpoint how you as an organisation relate to audiences on an emotional level is quite a daunting task. Um, for this reason, we actually found that museums who had some level of anthropomorphism, so humanising themselves, and who spoke and treated themselves like individuals rather than just sort of this faceless building or this faceless institution, were much more successful in creating emotionally engaging campaigns because um, you could really feel the personalities of the staff behind the face of the museum. And I think this is part of the reason why um, Skylight 9, obviously being a boat, being a ship, um, and ships always being called her, um, really helps to make people feel emotionally attached to this object, you know, this, this boat, on a much deeper level than if we were calling the boat it rather than she. Um, so for me, the first starting point in trying to apply these insights um, to making emotional campaigns is to ask, where are we now? Um, so what, where I would start with this is to list all of the ways in which you think as staff in the museum that your museum, whether that's your collections or your exhibitions, your projects, your learning programs, makes your audience feel different emotions. So the more the better, a complete brain dump onto a page. So um, as an example on the slide, I put, we make our audience feel inspired by exposing them to centuries worth of creativity. We make our audience feel welcomed by being friendly, helpful and inclusive. Um, and relaxed by providing spaces to reflect in a quiet environment. Um, and the, this brainstorming is the first step really in identifying where you currently are, where you think you currently are. But the next step is to actually ask your audience. So it might be uh, fortuitously that they list all the exact same emotions as you, that might, their experience of your museum might exactly match where, what you think their experience is but they might also have a really different point of view. So conducting some level of research into um, the, the actual emotions that you evoke in people um, is essential. So you can do this in most different ways. It doesn't have to be through a formal audience research big project. It can just be by going into the museum, having a really informal conversation by asking on social media, or to, just to reach out to members of the community and ask them really informally what they think um, and what sort of emotional benefits they receive from the museum. And once you've done this um, with your current audience, it's important to do the same activity again, but with your potential audience and supporters. So say, for example, you're a local authority funded museum um, with a, within a really large, diverse town, but the people who visit you are part of a small demographic. So they, a small demographic supports you and, and donates, but you could be reaching a much wider group. What are that wider group's emotional needs? So which of those emotional drivers is most likely to persuade them to visit and value and support the work that your museum does? So again, the same process, brainstorm what you think 
pick up the emotional um, connections that, that you could build and then go and ask them to see if they differ from what your viewpoint is. Um, <clears throat> so um, as part of this report, we put together a four step approach to launching an emotionally resonant campaign. So we designed it to be quite broad in scope because we know that museums have different needs. Um, you might be launching a campaign um, for support or a petition or a crowdfunder, or just to try and um, improve your messaging so that the support from your existing audience is um, strengthened. Um, or simply uh, try to increase cash donations, for example. Um, the first step, um, and this is all documented with examples in the report, um, if you want to check them. Um, the first step is to remind people of their experience with you. Um, so this is essentially a publicity drive. So any sort of publicity campaign to simply remind people that they might have had positive experiences with or, or, or inside your museum before um, and to raise awareness of your museum in public consciousness is the first step. Um, people have really busy lives. They have really, really active social lives and the amount of um, things to do there are now is just increasing year on year on year. And you know, lots of people in your community might have visited loads of museums or attractions and within the last couple of years, and you might simply have just fallen out of the front of their mind. Um, so a publicity campaign might look like raising awareness of your museum situation in the local or national press, um, recontacting e-news subscribers, posting on social media, so local Facebook groups, that sort of thing, reaching out to community groups and clubs, um, approaching LAPS members or friends if you have a membership campaign, um, approaching local schools, speaking to your museum's funder, contacting your local council or MP or speaking to peers across the sector to remind them that, hello, we exist um, and we need your help. The next step, number two, is to choose the audience for and scope of your campaign. So this is essentially who do you want to target and why? So it's absolutely essential to choose an audience for your campaign at the front end um, who you know are likely to be open to your messages because you, if you approach everyone, if you target everyone, you're likely to win over no one. Um, you might choose to target people demographically, so whether by age or location, um, or by their motivation for engaging with the museum. So for example, local families who are looking for fun or people across the UK with a particular interest in your subject matter. And when choosing your target audience, bear in mind that the list of emotions you brainstormed earlier and in any audience research you did to confirm this. So are there any audiences who could be a really quick win for your campaign who, uh, I don't know, associate with a particular emotion more than most um, or uh, someone who, I've just repeated myself, for whom one particular emotion resonates really strongly. Um, step three is to lay out your rational and practical reasons for why the public should support you. And this is what most museums um, that we spoke to were doing anyway. So it's, it's very easy to completely take emotions out of the equation and list practically, why does your museum need support from the public? What's in it for you? What's in it for them? Who, who is that going to benefit? You know, do you need money or time or um, resource or uh, publicity? It's really easy to list the rational steps, but not add the emotional level to them. Um, and finally, once you have laid out the rational steps, so you've identified your target audience, you've identified your rational arguments for support, consider which emotions you can play upon that will supercharge your case for support and paying particular, audience, uh, paying particular attention to your target audience and their emotional, the, the emotions that most strongly resonate with them. So imagine, for example, that your museum might need funds to help with energy costs, uh, as we're all experiencing at the moment, absolutely enormous energy costs. And when you're a public um, building, they're going to be even higher than a three bedroom house. So consider how evoking these different emotions might produce different results. So if you invoke nostalgia, you might invite people to recall what their first childhood experience with your museum was. Um, what did it mean to them? You know, it might have been on a school trip and they might have children themselves. And how would they feel if their children didn't have the same opportunity as you because the museum had to close because its running costs were so high? If you evoke pride, the same situation might become how would people feel if the story of their local history was lost and they weren't able to pass down the story of where they come from and who they are and what their town stands for. Um, if you evoke hope, um, you might want to speak about how your museum played an integral part in mobilising community support when COVID-19 hit. So there were so many amazing stories throughout COVID of museums playing really pivotal roles in, um, you know, in becoming uh, vaccination centres, for example. And it shows what's possible when communities come together to support one another. Um, and 
in turn, that could be a, an emotional position to ask for their help in your time of need when you've supported them in their time of need. And finally, if you evoke ownership, you could emphasize how the museum belongs to the town and is representative of everyone inside that town. So we offer a space for those who need inspiration or relaxation or knowledge, um, and the power to retain this resource is in your hands as well as ours. Um, this is my next slide on how to, <laughs> how to uh, take this uh, insight and apply it to uh, your longer term thinking. So I've covered um, the short term context, so how to use this insight for building short term campaigns for support. But on uh, exactly a month, it's the 22nd today, isn't it? On the 22nd of March, um, Elliot, my colleague, is going to be running through the long term implications of this research. So. Um, in the next webinar, we're going to be covering um, how you can um, leverage emotions for your long term practice. So obviously, in a campaign to, for support, a lot of it is about communication and messaging and, and positioning yourself in a certain way, um, but also the implications for what you actually have to offer the public in, the, in terms of collections or exhibitions. There are ways in which um, embedding these emotions in your actual offer um, plays a really big uh, role too, um, and how to use emotions to better engage your community and also um, audience development through an emotional lens. Um, so if you have any questions, we've got some time for questions, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, if you do have any particular questions, um, we can use that to inform um, the content of the next webinar, um, but we're equally happy to answer any questions you might have about our, the report or our approach or anything that I've just covered. Um, so yeah, I'll hand back to Christine. Thank you very much, Mariel. Um, we're going to stop the recording now so that if anybody has any